It's our duty to support veterans as they transition to their next mission, like Ben, who found his new career at Boeing through the SkillBridge program. We lead and work with some of the most highly motivated and talented people in the country. The SkillBridge kind of helps you translate all that experience. And Corrine, who found her next purpose with the mission continues. Once you get out of the military, you don't lose that sense to want to give and to want to make a difference. Learn more about the programs for veterans and their families at boeing.com slash veterans. Well, we did it, everyone. We made it to the end of the year. So today on CityCast Las Vegas, for our very last Friday News Roundup of 2023, we are bringing the whole team on board. Oh, yes, every last one of us for some joy, some chaos, and a fun look back at our year. We've got co-host David Figler and Sarah Lohman, producer Layla Mohammed, and newsletter editor Scott Dickensheets. It's Friday, December 22nd. I'm executive producer Sonia Cho Swanson, and here's what Las Vegas is talking about. Okay, hello, team. Welcome to the chaotic, joyful Friday News Roundup. <laughs> Rubble, Rubble. Hi, morning. Hey, everybody. I threw a little Hamburglar in there. I don't know why. <laughs> that is the best. Chaos and joy. That's what we're here for. Mm-hmm. Um, well, our first question of the day is a little bit about the news because it is still a Friday News Roundup. But I wanted to know, what was your most underrated news story of the year? Ooh, Who wants okay. to go first? So I'll go first. Um, My most underrated news story of the year is something that happened recently that I think is sliding a little bit under the radar with Mm. all of the holiday and end of the year hubbub. Um, But there is a tuberculosis. um, (coughs) Excuse me. Do you have have tuberculosis? (laughs) No, I do not have tuberculosis. Oh, no. oh my that gosh. Would be the, Layla, Layla, that would maybe I should go get tested. Well. Now I'm scared. Now I'm scared. I'm officially knocking on wood. Right. Same. Get well soon, Layla. I know. Fake Thank news, you. guys. She does not have tuberculosis. I do not have tuberculosis or COVID. I tested. I did okay. hug her yesterday. So. <laughs> Watch out. Okay, so. There is a tuberculosis spreading investigation going on in Clark County School District right now. There is one person that visited 26 schools and Why? one training facility. Um, and, yeah. And over 600 people could have come into contact with that one person. So Clark County School District, those 26 schools principals sent out letters to families and um, parents telling them about the out. Not the outbreak, because it's not an outbreak. There have been no other confirmed cases, but mm. the potential the spread exposure. of, yes, mm. exposure okay. um, to tuberculosis on their campuses. So one school is going to get completely tested in January. Wow. And people who have come into close contact with that one person um, have already started getting tested this week. Generically, wow. have they said what the role of that person was? I know they don't want to identify yeah. the person yet. Yeah, no, they haven't said what the role was. They did visit 26 campuses and a training facility. So people are guessing that it's a, probably an instructor or a trainer of some sort. Do we have a tuberculosis vaccine? We do have a tuberculosis vaccine. In the United States, it isn't that popular because of the cost of it. Um, okay. But other countries usually give the tuberculosis vaccine to infants and toddlers. It's more popular in other countries, which is why huh. it spreads. Um, we see tuberculosis cases in the United States. There was another one at Palo Verde High School, oh, weird. but that's unrelated. I mean, I know that we, I'm assuming part of the reason we don't vaccinate too is because we've largely eradicated it with this, with antibiotics. Mm-hmm. Um, but I actually do know someone personally Personally, that had tuberculosis and he I mean this is the least of his problems but he couldn't drink for a oh. year although oh. he was like a, a beer tour educator so that was kind uh. of a, it impacted Oof. his job because yeah. the it, you know 
the treatment for it lasts that long. It's a really mm. long process. And I also understand why there's not a rush for testing because it is it is a deadly d- disease, but it's a very slow killer. It's, mm. you know, until we got antibiotics, uh, World War II, this was a death sentence, but a very, very, very slow one. And ironically, people would come to places like Las Vegas because it's believed that like either mountain climates or like dry desert air was good for tubercular patients. Interesting. Is that I don't myth? think it was. Oh, I, I don't yeah. think it was. Maybe, it, maybe, you know what? Maybe it alleviated symptoms, but I don't think that there was really any escape from it. I don't know what the survival rate of tuberculosis was, tuberculosis was in the 19th century, but it definitely wasn't good. Yeah, they called it consumption back then. I always Consum- think that's an interesting. <laughs> oh my wow. God. Yeah. yeah. It is so miserable. <laughs> it's a very old timey disease. My sister used to work at a preschool and she had to get tested for TB pretty often because oh, wow. they're, yeah, they want to keep it away from children, of course. Um, mm-hmm. But it's it's just kind of something to keep your eye on because with everyone going on break for the holidays, kids are spending time with their mm-hmm. families and traveling. So just keep an eye on the sick kids if your kid is feeling a little under the weather. Okay, who wants to share their next most underrated story of 2023? Oh, I'll jump in. I, uh, hey, really... David, all right. Yes. Jump in, David. Yeah, I'm going to just jump in. I was um, engrossed with the reporting of uh, Review Journal reporters uh, Taylor Avery and Jessica Hill about the various conflicts of interest of our citizen legislature. Uh, Mm. They came out late fall, uh, looking back at the spring session. Of course, our Nevada legislature only meets every other year for 120 days. But it, it it got me thinking because I think it was a little patchwork and some of the reporting, I think, was a bit of a stretch for conflicts. But I think that the the community really needs more of this kind of reporting, especially with our electeds, whether they be mm-hmm. legislators or judges um, or lobbyists, you know, who go in front of them. There's been also some um, light reporting about uh, Jeremy Aguero, who found a workaround of not having to disclose that he's a lobbyist and advocating for things like public like hundreds of millions of dollars of public funding going to these private sports businesses and stuff mm-hmm. like that. What's um, an example? What's an example of the conflict of interest in our legislature? Mm-hmm. Well, they they did a follow up story about all of the um, legislators who are landlords and how they voted on tenant protection laws. Um, oh. Spoiler, not all of them <laughs> supported tenant protection laws mm. and they own property. And so it really, to me, was underrated because it didn't talk about how we talk about our legislators and the various conflicts of interest and not just financial conflicts of interest, but personal relationships. And I mean, that's just a very Nevada thing to kind of gloss it over. But I think, I don't know, maybe those people who are voting on things that uh, affect us all should be like, oh, I don't know, those NASCAR drivers who when they Mm -hmm. wear their jackets, they have (laughs) to have the patches of all their sponsors and supporters. Yes. You know, that'd be nice to know um, the the, the back. ground of the person who is voting against the thing that might be otherwise important for the community. Mm, so I think exactly. it was an underrated story. That is a brilliant idea, David. NASCAR, oh, you like jacket. The NASCAR jacket. I love yeah. it. I love it. <laughs> Although I guess I will say the one pushback is that these are folks who can actually be out in the community and they're they're living yeah. the the citizens, you know, experience right now in 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 Nevada. So maybe that's the that's the pushback for why we have a citizen legislature or David, what or remind, the benefit is. Remind me what the schedule is for our citizen legislature. Uh, they meet for 180 days um, every other year in every the other spring. Year. Mm-hmm. Okay. I mean, it is, it, it seems like a crazy short time, I think, to other people who have full time legislatures. Sure. But I do think it's a factor in um, the reason why Nevada has a majority female legislature and more than half of those women are mothers. Hmm. Um, you know, women, even when we're single, we still fall, we still get a lot of the second shift, like coming home and taking care of the household. So this is allowing more women to participate in our legislature. Um, so it's an unusual way to do it, but I'm really into it. But also, not necessarily what you're arguing against. You think that you just really want more transparency in this. Yes, right. yes. Right. Because not because they're... moms can have conflicts. Yeah, it's not. <laughs> they're not. Would you the say baby any... lobby is very strong in Nevada, <laughs> David? Oh God, they are. <laughs> yeah. That's the Nevada way, David. <laughs> <laughs> juice, juice without, uh, yeah, without straining it.
You've probably noticed that CityCast ads don't sound like other podcast ads, and that's because we're not just reciting national ad scripts. We're using our own words to talk about local businesses we know and care about, like the one we did about the list.vegas or the one about the Vegas Unstripped Food Festival. Sometimes CityCast ads are hilarious. They're frequently passionate. They're always heartfelt. That's the thing about doing ads for businesses that are part of the city you care about, and one reason we just won Adweek's Podcast Innovator of the Year Award. Get your business or product in front of people who care about this city as much as we do. Consider placing an ad with CityCast, the podcast innovators of the year. And it's not just our city, by the way. CityCast has dedicated local teams in Boise, Chicago, Denver, D.C., Houston, Madison, Philly, Pittsburgh, Portland, and Salt Lake, and soon Austin and Nashville. Place an ad today in the cities that matter to your company. Reach out at ads at citycast.fm. That's ads at citycast.fm. Next Saturday, Christmas comes early, only on Peacock. Unbelievable! Bills, Chargers, an exclusive NFL game live in primetime. Next Saturday, 7.30 Eastern, exclusively on Peacock. Okay, next underrated story. Uh, Sarah, what you got? Oh, my God. I have to talk about the Transfix art exhibit at Resorts World because I feel like no one remembers this. And it's just a personal trauma that I endured for oh, exposure. No. <laughs> I worked there for three days, I but I'm not going to say anything that wasn't in the public record. And my my boss was Brent Holmes. So it was a real experience. Oh, friend of the pod and contributor Brent Holmes. Very nice. So this is supposed to be a exhibit of large scale, interactive, kinetic art, um, mostly Burning Man artists, but not necessarily. But the idea was pieces that were hard to show in museums. And so it was starting in Las Vegas It opened in April. It was going to end in the fall and then like tour the country for at least two years, but hopefully come back in different, you know, different mm-hmm. variations. Mm-hmm. The issue was there was nobody from Vegas in the top teams. And so they were making really poor decisions, both in the build out and the sort of visitor experience, um, but also the price point. The tickets were about $80 to go see this exhibit. Yikes. Yikes. So very, very quickly, within four weeks, they weren't making payroll because of low attendance. And the whole thing shut down within six weeks. And then here's the real nightmare. When Uh-oh. it shut down, they went bankrupt and they left the artists' art pieces sitting out in front of Resorts World, uncovered, unprotected until July. So they shut down in May and the pieces weren't removed until July. And they were only removed because the artists started to go fund me and relied on volunteer what? labor. People offered their trust and their skills to disassemble the art. The last I heard, it was in storage, covered storage in Las Vegas, but there wasn't enough money to actually return it to the artist. Yeah, this company just went bankrupt and didn't stop answering emails and phone calls and just left everything there. Wow. Oh, my God. I know, a nightmare. Does Resorts World take any responsibility? Have we even heard from No, basically they said that they rented space uh, and that we have nothing to do with this and, and get this junk off our property. Ooh, boy. Yeah. I smell lawsuits. Well, color me unsurprised anyway, uh, for one, just because this this sounds like the collision of like incantatory buzzwords like Las mm. Vegas Strip and Burning Man and immersive. Mm. Yeah, and immersive. Yeah, it's, it's, And that sounds like where the planning stopped. And yeah. I have a longstanding, well-known antipathy towards Burning Man art anyway. Yeah. Uh, like a lot of that stuff, I don't think would have seen the inside of a, a real, mu- you know, actual top line museums anyway. So... But I do hate the idea of artists not getting paid for their work. Yes. That is a deplorable development. And, you know, art has a an off and on history on the strip anyway, if you think yeah. back to the Hermitage Museums in the uh, in the Venetian that, that you know, splatted terrifically. So uh, this seems just like another entry in that in that sad ledger. You know, having been in the exhibit, some of the pieces were super, super cool, but the price point was way, way, way too high. And the real enraging thing is they would give all these speeches about like that they're taking down the velvet ropes and they're removing the gatekeepers of the art world and making art for everyone at 80 bucks a ticket. So what a miserable, miserable event. Ugh. Well, uh, let's uh, let's never see a repeat of that. Resorts no. World do better. Transfix do better. And good Transfix luck. is bankrupt, and Resorts World has washed their hands of it. So let's just oh do better for God. artists all around, right? Absolutely. Yes. Take that eighty bucks and buy two pies from twelve twenty eight. I think one and a half pies, David. Actually, yeah, right. Yeah. 
<laughs> uh, Scott, what you got for underrated news of the year? Well, I want to talk for a minute about education. I mean, we're as we record this, we're just barely downwind from the historic teachers school district contract agreement, uh, which you know dominated the headlines for so long. And there were a lot of other education stories that were above the fold. But bubbling underneath all of that for me, like the you know, like the Yellowstone super volcano, is <laughs> is the ongoing effect of the pandemic on on our students. There were intermittent re- bits of reporting on it, but we have mm. definitely put off the reckoning that you know that is there in the metrics. If you if you look at you know the the number of of, of five star schools that the district had before the pandemic, which is like 120, I think. Mm-hmm. And it's down to now like 85, and there are a lot more one-star oh, wow. schools. And the, the the numbers of kids who are chronically absent from school has climbed to like in the mid 30s percent. Wow! So, and these are just and then anecdotally, if you talk to educators or whatever, you'll hear about just how much rougher and more fraught the students' lives are, and the students' interactions at school and so on. So, I think we have sort of not dealt with the ongoing effects of, of that that shutdown. Mm-hmm. And there have actually been like studies, the, the Las Vegas Weekly reported on one in like February, that show that it might actually have affected like children's brain structures. Yeah. Oh, uh, wow. All that, all, that iso- all that isolation, that focus on screen time, <gasps> and the social cost of, oh. of, of being away from, of that lost year that they had, so. Right, in um, their formative early like youth, that's, mm-hmm. that's right. wild. Now that I have sort of, you know, crossed the rickety bridge into, into old age, <laughs> I have a renewed interest in who's going to grow up to be doctors? Who's going to grow up to be, sure. you know, the people who keep society running? And I think we're so caught up in other educational issues that as a society, we need to focus on, like, making things better for the kids as a whole so that we don't lose them. It's like mm-hmm. yeah. Life. Yeah, because I remember during the pandemic, my niece um, was in the middle of high school. Mm. And when everything shut down, it just seemed like she lost all of her friends. And she would talk about how she's so lonely and she doesn't have friends anymore. And a lot of my friend's younger siblings said that similar thing where they just don't feel like they have any friends. So I feel like that social connection really did do a number on these kids going back to school because when my niece was finally able to go back to campus she was a senior at that point so Mm. she didn't even want to go to school she didn't want to try she just felt so disheartened with the whole academic process and now she's out of the Clark County School District system um, and in college Mm. and kind of still feeling like well I don't really want to go to college I don't want to go to school so I think this the psychological damage that that has done on kids, I I can't even imagine how um, that's going to have to be addressed in coming years because I don't think the Clark County School District did a great job of addressing maybe violence before because my niece's middle school was pretty violent. So mm. I feel like this is an uphill battle for them. But I mean, one of the tr- one of the hard truths is this is like sort of sort of like reverse Russian nesting dolls, right? Every time you open a problem, there's a bigger problem inside. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so you get like the larger social issues of, you know, poverty and, you know, people who don't have resources, high rental rates, evictions. All of this feeds back into the ability of families to give the proper mm-hmm. back-end support for kids who are, who are, you know, having trouble in school or just trying to make it through school. Mm-hmm. And so there's like a lot of interconnected issues but, you know, America is like, you know, well, we took the masks off. Everything's OK now. So that's our that's our post pandemic, you know, sort of uh, attitude. And yeah, it's not helping students. Yeah, there's no one fix for this. So, like, where do we even start, Scott? Do you have any thoughts on that? I wish I did. If I did, I'd, I would try you and would share them, them for free. I would, <laughs> I, would, I, would, I, would, I would blast them out there. But yeah, yeah. well, I guess one one start is the new uh, pay agreements that CCSD teachers mm. and the district have come to. Mm-hmm. Hopefully this will help us retain some great talent. Stability, great, very yeah. important. Mm-hmm. Stability so, is a good one. Yeah. So fingers crossed, right? All right, I have one last underrated news story for y'all. Um, you guys remember that in March, we got a Vikwame designated as a national monument this yeah, year. Yeah, so exciting. Such great news. There's actually, though, another proposed national monument in the works, which I didn't know until I saw some articles come out this summer. Um 
from the Review Journal and Las Vegas Weekly. Uh, it's been in the works since 2021, but they've only recently got this press coverage. It's in East Las Vegas. Uh, they're going to be reviewing and coming up with a new name for it. They're not going to just call it the East Las Vegas National Monument, <laughs> which would be pretty underwhelming, but they're going to be working with the local Paiute tribes to come up with some uh, culturally significant names. But what's cool is that this encompasses that area around Frenchman Mountain, Sunrise Mountain, and beyond, which I didn't realize was actually really culturally significant to the um, local Paiute tribes. It's part of their Salt Song Trail, which mm-hmm. um, represents like the the songs they sang to describe the geography and the the travels and like where to kind of get like you know water and salt and so forth, like all along this whole like path through the Southwest. Um, it's also geologically significant because there's a, a buried portion of a certain era like geological era that is only visible you know on the surface in certain areas and one of them is at frenchman mountain whoa like i know i had no idea you guys i had no idea so there's actually a lot going on there i have never been out there actually i have to confess and now i'm like totally dying to go do you know the name of that geological uh, anomaly what, what like is it the great unconformity oh wow <laughs> I how love many it. how many poems have been and or need to be written with that title? Absolutely, so many. Las Vegas poets, Las Vegas so poets, many. challenge, gauntlet, yeah, go for it. So, so one of the activists trying to get this monument put together said that even though Viquame took twenty five years in the making, they're hoping to get a designation for their monument within five. So, I guess we'll see. Well, as a longtime Las Vegan, I hope that one of the uh, you know, criteria for entry into this monument is that you can distinguish Frenchman Mountain from Sunrise Mountain. <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh Impossible. My gosh. I might not be allowed in, you guys. I think sometimes they switch places <laughs> just to F with us. <laughs> right. That's a good point. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It'll be really nice for the East Side to get um, a national monument, too. They uh, they need some really great outdoor spaces over there. So yeah. that'll be great for that community. Fun, fun fact, Frenchman Mountain was named after a guy who was Belgian. <laughs> True story. Damn, uh, that, makes know, sense. Close. that makes sense during American yeah. history. He might have spoke French. I don't know, uh, but yeah, he was a miner. And uh, also, the area offers some. The area offers some fantastic views of the valley too. It's, mm. You get yeah. a really I've never been over there. You get a really great perspective oh, of, of the yeah. city. Looking at the valley from the yeah. east side up there, uh, it's stunning. It's a it's a underrated underrated vantage. Mm-hmm. Okay, twenty twenty four team outing. Let's go check out. Uh, you know, oh the, yeah, let's get sporty. The great unconformity. Yeah, let's go to Belgian Mountain. <laughs> yeah, the Belgian Mountain. <laughs> we'll go check yeah. out the great unconformity. All right, y'all, we're moving into the next part of our Friday News Roundup. We're going to go super rapid fire. I want to go around the circle, and I want to hear what was the best meal you had out in Las Vegas this year. I'm going to popcorn this to Sarah. Go. Roberto's. <laughs> oh, it was after a really long drive from LA, and before I even got to my house, I got that bean and cheese burrito and a horchata, and it was perfect, just what I, I needed. Love I love it. Okay, Sarah, popcorn to someone else. David. I'm going to go with a fancy fancy because we had a celebratory dinner not terribly long ago. We went to Anima by EDO. Uh, yes, yes. It was very, very far from downtown Las Vegas, but totally mm-hmm. worth it. The service, the food, the ambiance, everything was uh, AA double plus. And I heard they just got like Yelp's best restaurant of the country award. Whoa. So uh, good on them. Mm-hmm. Everyone should go check that out, even Pretty though it's city. basically in Bakersfield from where I'm standing. <laughs> <laughs> David, you want a popcorn? Oh, yeah. I want a popcorn to Layla. Yes. So the best meal I had out this year was actually really recent and probably because I'm remembering it. But at Kase Sake and Sushi, um, Mm -hmm. it was an omakase course, seven courses. um, On the menu, it says umori. So Mm -hmm. whatever their seven course tasting menu is. And it was so good. All the fish was so buttery and the beer was great. They have great sake selection. So definitely check that out on Jones. Mm. Um, all right, I'll popcorn to Scott. Uh, the best meal I, m- meal out I had this year was uh, my wife and I, for our anniversary, went to a place called 138, mm. and I had the steak frites, and it was uh, oh. which tracks because I'm a meat and potatoes guy, mm. but it, everything was perfectly well done. Uh, unfortunately, I can't replicate that experience because that's one of the restaurant casualties of of the year. But Aww. it was, Aww. but I had a great meal when I was there. Sonia, bring us home. Okay, my pick is also a sushi pick, Layla. It is a restaurant on Charleston, West Charleston, called Sushi Hiroyoshi. 
And uh, it's a tiny strip mall uh, shop. If you go, there's just the sign that says sushi on the top. There's no store name or restaurant name on it. But it's got a really lovely uh, omakase menu, uh, actually really lovely quality, and I actually think a really good value as well. My husband took me there for my birthday earlier this year, and we got this little jewel box of um, sashimi, and it was just really lovely. I, I had a great time there. Nice. We're going to move on to the last segment, which is that Scott has an announcement to share with all of our audience. It's true. Come mid-February, I will be retiring from active duty in the uh, in the journalism world. I started in 1985 in a little newspaper in Henderson typing stories on manual typewriters. Wow. And cut and paste was a literal uh, thing there. It no. was yeah, we chop up your you chop up your stories, mm-hmm. tape them back together uh, in the right arrangement and then go hand them to a typesetter. Wow. And so uh, and I've made my way through most of the media shops in this town, not all but but most uh, over the ensuing years and I'm going to come February retire to a life of gentlemanly freelancing and uh, <laughs> um, and watch my grandkids grow up. Oh, oh, nice. Scott, Congratulations, Scott. Thank you so That's much. so amazing, Scott. Yeah. What a storied uh, journalism career you have had, though. I think we yeah. should just celebrate that, too. Mm-hmm. Well, I like I like that I'm ending on a high note with, with this amazing team, yeah. this great company, this, oh. these, and like, you know, a, a, just a ton of really great readers. I hear from a lot of them mm-hmm. all the time. I've developed some personal back and forth relationships with some. I will miss that. I will miss you guys, and I will miss, um, you know, some of the work that we do. Uh, but I won't mind not waking up at five thirty in the morning to add a harried last minute note to the newsletter <laughs> and to read every media outlet in Las Vegas every day, <laughs> constant. Yeah, yeah, I could see that too. Yeah. That'll be good for my head. There we go. Well, Scott, we will miss you, and you also yeah. have uh, left behind some big shoes to fill. We are yeah. hiring. We're a newsletter editor, and that job is at citycast.fm slash jobs. So pass that although, around, folks. Although, to be clear, you do not need large feet to fill this position. <laughs> you could have small feet. It's true. You could have yeah. small feet. Small feet and big ideas. All right. Well, Scott, <laughs> yes, that is not a job. Never. No, Scott. No, no, no. There you go. <laughs> okay. Uh, Scott, well... We um we love you so much, and yeah. we can't wait to get two more months with you in 2024. Yeah. It'll be fun. Well, thank you for this joyful, chaotic, amazing Friday News Roundup, y'all. It has been a joy. This year has really been a joy working with all of you, and yeah. I so appreciate you. Thank you. Back at you. Sonia. Thanks, Sonia. See you next year. Thanks, team. Bye, everyone. <laughs> That's all for today here on CityCast Las Vegas. I'm executive producer Sonia Cho Swanson. Our producer is Leila Mohammed. Our newsletter editor is Scott Dickensheets. And our hosts are David Figler and Sarah Lohman. Music is by OG Moose, Epidemic Sound, and All the Kimonos. We record this show on the traditional homelands of the Nibuvi, the Southern Paiute people. If you enjoyed the show, and I know you did, do a little holiday gift, a little holiday favor, and go tell five friends, go tell 10 friends, tell them about the show. Then rate the show, leave us a review, and subscribe to our brilliant morning newsletter. Starting on Tuesday, we're going to be bringing you our favorite episodes about the biggest news stories of the year. And then we'll be back on Tuesday, January 2nd, with a whole bunch of new episodes for the new year. Happy New Year, everyone, and we'll see you in 2024. Thank you.